I'm Barbara Ridpap, and I am director of St. Paul's Institute. And we're really pleased you're all here to listen uh, to the presentations today, some of which will be about our report and some of which will be around the report. Uh, many of you were involved at different stages and we're very grateful. On your tables, there are proof copies of the actual report. We're hoping to have the final version, both electronically and in print, very shortly. Um, if we have your name and email from the attendance list, we'll make sure you get that. I apologize for it not being ready for the launch. Um, that's entirely my fault, and I'm very sorry. Uh, our very first speaker is Heaton Shaw, who's chair of Friends Provident, who very kindly, Friends Provident Foundation very kindly sponsored our work on this. Um, and it's a very, I, I'll let him talk about it, but it was a very interesting first collaboration, I think, where they're actually working with their own investment side to think about issues that matter to them. But Hitan, I'll let you talk about that. Well, thanks, Barbara. And it gives me a uh, great delight to welcome the report today. Uh, and I say this uh, in a kind of, with a grant-making hat, with an investor's hat and with an activist's hat. Uh, and in a sense, that's, that's the way that the foundation creates change. So uh, the Friends Provident Foundation is an independent uh, grant-making body uh, which is trying to create a more fa fair and sustainable economy. And I know that we share that ethos with many organizations that are represented in the room today. Uh, and inequality has been a core theme of our world uh, since, since we've been uh, funding in this area for the last few years. And as I say, we create change in three ways, and I just wanted to illustrate how we're doing that across uh, each of these areas. So first of all, we fund through grants, and we funded uh, this report, which we're really pleased to see. We're funding the Equality Trust at the moment to do some work uh, in this area, analyzing FTSE 100 companies, uh, looking at their pay ratios sector by sector so that you can actually do serious comparisons in that way, as well as other kind of data that they're producing. We're also funding the IPPR Commission on Economic Justice, which is taking a kind of wholesale look at the structure of our co economy uh, and whether it's fit for purpose in uh, really uh, helping everybody. Uh, and the Archbishop of Canterbury is one of our commissioners on that uh, uh, commission, so we think it will be a, a really powerful analysis when it's published later this year. So, we work through grants, but we also work as an investor ourselves, and I think this is more unusual amongst foundations. Uh, we take our endowment and we invest it and we think about it uh, as, a, as a real force for good. So, we want to engage on the issues raised in the report today uh, with the investment community to say how can we act as an investor to create change on these issues. We'll be pushing our fund managers who are represented in the audience today to think about this, so we're really pleased they're here. We'll be working through the Church Investors Group, through CRIN uh, and others, and we'd really like to work in partnership with all of you on this. And then finally, uh, again, uh, slightly uniquely amongst the foundation world, we try to convene and we try to advocate. So we will take our own positions on things rather than just thinking that uh, that's a job for other people. So we did support uh, the introduction of uh, mandatory pay ratios when the government was consulting on this and we've got a uh, very well written submission on that which uh, Colin, our investment manager, put together. So that's the way that we act and I just want to give you a kind of microcosm of uh, how we try to create change as a foundation uh, in this space. Turning to the report itself, uh, I had the privilege of seeing a, a kind of pre-proof copy, as it were, uh, and I can tell you that uh, it's a really good report, it's very practical, uh, and it takes a systemic view of how we create change, which I really like. So, uh, you know, I uh, very much uh, uh, put it forward to you, uh, and I hope that we can all work together around the issues it, it raises. One of the things, as you'd expect, is that it calls for the publication of pay ratios, uh, one thing I like about it is it says it recognises that these accrued measures which alone will often be misread. Uh, with my day job hat on, I run the Royal Statistical Society and you know, we're very aware of the way that numbers are used and abused uh, all over the place. Um, but I think the, the recent publication of gender pay data it, it gives us some good lessons. If it hadn't happened at all, none of the debates which uh, were stirred up w would have occurred. So in that sense, putting that data out there, despite it being imperfect, despite the methodologies being contested, was, I think, a helpful step. 
Having said that, uh, we looked at the data ourselves and hundreds of companies had either a zero mean or median data uh, pay gap, uh, which we thought was statistically pretty implausible. Uh, so, you know, uh, we, we ended up saying, have they cherry-picked the data, have they analysed it in the wrong way? We're not sure, but at least it's drawn attention to the issues uh, and it's forcing people to have that conversation. The methodologies can be iterated over time. So, data, in my view, as you'd expect, uh, can be a real force for good if, if used in the right way, and that sort of transparency agenda is really critical. So, uh, th th that's really all I had to say in terms of my opening remarks. I apologise, I'm going to have to sneak off early to my next meeting, but I do want to stay for as long as I can uh, to, to hear the speakers. And I'd just like to thank uh, the, the, the St Paul's Institute for bringing us all together uh, around this agenda. Thank you very much. Actually, if anybody has any intelligence on when the government is actually going to come out with those proposals that are due in May, as we're running out of days in May, I'd be very interested in hearing um, any inside information on where. Do course. <laughs> Does due course come after May? <laughs> Anyway, um, our next speaker, I'm very grateful that he could make it today, is Reverend Canon Edward Carter. He is chair of the Church Investors Group. He's also canon theologian at Chelmsford Cathedral and has been a great supporter of the Institute since I've been here so, and was involved in, we did a couple of roundtables around this subject uh, after the first draft. Those of you who saw the first draft, there's absolutely nothing in common between the first and second drafts, which shows you just how much influence the private roundtables had. Um, I'm not going to go over everybody's bios. You have them in your program, but I'm just going to turn the floor over to Edward. Well, thank you, Barbara, very much indeed. Um, I'm the kind of warm-up act to, the, to the, main, the main event, and I'm not going to speak particularly about the report, nor, in fact, particularly about the issue of um, fair pay for fair work, um, because that wasn't the title you gave me, Barbara. I hope that's okay, um, but it's a great privilege to be here. Um, uh, the Church Investors Group, I'm chair of the Church Investors Group, um, it's a really an alliance, just so you know, an alliance of some 60-odd members um, faith-based, church-based Christian, um, mainly UK, but with a few other members from overseas. Um, I, I will stretch the number a bit, but let's say upwards of um, 20 billion funds under management. So what that means is um, big enough to be noticed, but obviously not monstrously big compared with um, the size of, of the whole uh, city. Um, but big enough to be noticed, and when we do uh, do some work on our issue, when we try and prod uh, some of the companies that we're invested in, um, then they do at least uh, make an attempt to, to notice, and often uh, our engagements with them uh, can be quite fruitful. Um, and this issue of executive pay is certainly one that's very important to us. We've done some good work on the low pay end and the various other issues, modern day slavery, um, but this issue of executive pay is certainly a very important issue to us at the Church Investors Group. Um, yes, I'm based at Chelmsford Cathedral, which is somewhat smaller than St Paul's Cathedral, I think it has to be said. Um, but it's, um, it's very good to be here, and I'm involved with a little bit in some of the Church of England world of um, funds and money. Um, but although my biography is on the sheet, I did just want to mention that um, at an earlier incarnation, um, uh, before I put the dog collar on, I did run my own business and work for small companies, so I kind of have that bit in me. And I'm, my, my basic stance is one of being sympathetic uh, as to what businesses can achieve and the place that businesses and commerces and enterprises have um, within uh, the, the bigger picture of the world. Um, so that kind of um, yes moment when, if, if any of you have ever worked um, in, in business or in a small company particularly, that moment when, when a sale comes in that you knew was really important and someone lands it and you know this is really going to be a significant thing or you've come up with some new product or service that you know people want and that excitement as you all kind of say yes, 
Uh, we're really going places. Um, that's kind of part of me. I sometimes um, say that, um, you know, often ask members of the clergy, where do you feel closest to heaven here on earth? And they'll usually describe kind of up a mountain or, or some beautiful picturesque scene. For me, and I'm not joking, for me, it's um, down in one of those little industrial estates, seeing all the people really working hard at whatever it is they're trying to do, um, uh, that, that, that buzz of enterprise. Um, I think there's something of God in all of that. Um, so that's by way of a kind of preamble, really. Um, and, and I suppose what that means is that both the Church Investors Group and, and me personally um, would be a kind of critical friend of some of these companies that we're talking about uh, when we look at this issue. Well, I've been doing um, quite a bit of thinking recently about questions of identity. Identity. Um, and when we think of a, a person, an individual, um, then issues of identity, of course, are very important indeed. Um, and they play out um, in various ways, that, that issue of identity plays out in various ways. So certainly um, the abilities that we have, the gifts that we have, the things we're good at, the things we enjoy, that's very much part of our identity, yes. Um, also, the relationships that we have, are the ways in which we are, for me, a father, a husband, um, a, 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 a priest with, with parishioners, all that kind of thing, um, a colleague to various people, work colleagues. All those relationships, of course, are very much part of our identity as well. And then um, for people of faith, there's something about our identity under God also. Um, so no doubt more could be said, but you can see how um, when we consider an individual, uh, questions of identity are really very important indeed. Um, and one of the things that's very interesting about a limited liability company is, of course, you all know this, um, that it has a kind of identity of its own. It has, as we know, a, a legal personality, we might almost say. It has um, a legal identity. That's one of the great things about a limited liability company. Um, we might almost say it has um, a license given to it by the community, by society, to have this identity, um, or in slightly more concise form, a license to operate, a license to do stuff um, off its own bat. And I'm not a great economic historian, although I do enjoy dipping into it, um, but my kind of thumbnail sketch um, of economic history in this kind of field would be along the lines of uh, pointing out the importance of the medieval monasteries and the guilds. Here in London, the guilds still go, but they're not absolutely uh, the kind of driving force of the whole economy anymore. Um, they operated very successfully for many centuries um, under a slightly different model of has to be said, a kind of feudal model, even hints of a kind of theocratic model. Um, and the invention of the joint stock company um, was a very, very significant thing because it kind of disrupted, to use that terminology, um, the old world, the old rather fixed and feudal world. It made possible all sorts of, of new things. Um, so it was a, a liberating moment in economic history, um, the, uh, the way in which these new companies um, had an identity of their own. It meant uh, that uh, people could uh, pull resources, of course, and that risks to be, could be taken. Um, and you no longer had to accept your place in the feudal um, structures. You could, as it were, kind of tip the apple cart over. So a wonderful, we might say, and, and, and a powerful thing. Of course, if you were at the top, of the feudal tree, I don't know, for example, having your wedding at St George's Chapel and being a prince, that kind of thing, then this would all be very unsettling. You'd have to find some new way of existing, which of course they managed to do in the case of the royal family. It, uh, it disrupted the whole world and yet it unleashed a tremendous amount of power because the people at the bottom of the pile previously just had to accept that they were kind of stuck, that was where they were, um, they had their place. But now suddenly, if you had the ability, and you had um, the way given to you now with these joint stock uh, companies um, to kind of um, do new things 
and well, anything was possible. And indeed, that's what happened. These companies were very much part of the um, explosive growth in the size of the economy, very much linked to the Industrial Revolution, all of that. Um, I think I would just drop in as kind of an aside. The change in the nature of money as well um, was also very significant in that transition. Um, so that's the kind of background to why companies are significant, the power that they have unleashed, um, but also um, the responsibilities uh, that that brings. Um, because back to this identity theme, um, the identity of this, this thing which we call a, a company, um, which we've granted an identity, um, well, it also has that relational aspect to it. I tried to say um, at the start that our identity as individuals is to do with our gifts and abilities, yes, but also to do with the relationships uh, that we have. And I think the same obviously is true of um, the companies uh, that have their own identity as well. And so, um, to link it to the title that I've been given, the social purpose of business is part of their identity. Um, it is, um, in effect, a part of what they are in the world. So, remember, note to self really, but note to all of us, note to, to the world, remember that this gift of identity to these companies is actually an amazing gift. You know, it is an extraordinary gift when you think about it. We've, we've kind of created a new way of, 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 a, of, a, of an institution having an identity. And it is a kind of gift. It's helpful to think of it in terms of it being a gift. Um, who's it a gift from? Well, it's kind of a gift by way of the laws of the land and all of that. But it's a gift from the wider community. It's a gift from society um, to enable certain very important things to happen. And as I said a moment ago, it does come, this gift comes, like all gifts really, uh, comes with responsibilities. And I wanted just to uh, flag up um, a couple of things um, as regards um, the responsibilities that comes with. Um, of course, this thing we're looking at today is kind of part of that mix, really, isn't it? The responsibility that companies have. Um, but I think I want to kind of anchor it in a couple of more, not exactly conceptual things, but kind of deeper rooted things. And one would be having a proper sense of history, um, the story of, of the, uh, the, the individual stroke company, the identity that you have, the history there. And the other would be something to do with place or geography, in fact. Um, because our own identities as individuals, my own identity, um, has all sorts of different ingredients within it, but the story that is my life is a very important part of my identity where I've come from, where I'm hoping to go to. That kind of timeline idea, um, which we're perhaps quite familiar with. So if that's true for me and for other um, people with identities, then I think it should be true for companies as well, uh, for businesses. And again, our identities as individuals, as often we describe them, we describe ourselves often with reference to place, where, we've, where we live and where we perhaps were born, where we grew up. You know, we anchor ourselves in the geography of our, of our lives and of the world. And again, I think that's a really important aspect of identity and therefore um, should be an important aspect of the identity that companies have as well. And, and the sadness in a way, as I look at the, the corporate sector, um, sadness is that all too often a sense of being anchored both in history and in place has worn a bit thin, I think I would um, say that. Um, companies, by and large, bigger companies in particular, um, now they, they have less and less regard to their, their corporate story. It's all about this quarter's results. You know, it's kind of about the numbers. Of course the numbers matter. You know, part of the Church Investors Group represents pension funds. We, we need a return. We need, we need some income coming through. We need to, you know, I'm looking forward to getting a pension, I hope, at some point. I'm sure I will. I hope the Church of England Pensions Board will do their stuff. Yes, of course, that's part of the story of a successful company. Back to my yes moment when I was involved with small companies. You couldn't just sit around having fun. You had to make money. You had to sell stuff. Of course, that's all absolutely real. But to have that sense of a corporate story 
as part of the identity, I think, is really important. And the, and the thing about place, I think, is also important. You know, we, it always used to be that um, Sheffield steel, you know, steel came from Sheffield. Why? Not because it was 0.1% cheaper to make it there, but just because that was the place where steel was made. Now, it sounds really antiquated to say something like that now, but, but of course, in a way, um, that, that, is, that should be, I think, still a real thing, uh, that companies belong in places, have a loyalty. You think of the great um, Quaker enterprises of the, um, the 19th century, particularly. Uh, we, just, we just know that the Cadbury business belonged in Birmingham and Bourneville and all of that. You know, we know that's part of their story as a company. Um, and it would be crazy, it would have been crazy for them to say, well, we'll outsource the making of these lovely chocolate bars to China or something because it's a tiny bit cheaper to make. It just wouldn't have made sense. Anyway, I mentioned um, earlier on uh, that there might be a third aspect of identity. And I describe that as being under God. Um, and um, in a way, this question of identity is at the heart of, um, well, not just the Christian worldview, but actually the, the kind of faith based worldview. Uh, both for uh, individual people, that's often articulated by all the faiths, certainly uh, the Christian faith that I'm uh, part of. Um, identity for me as a Christian is part of, of the mix, non-negotiable. And being a bit bold for a second, I think this is actually also true of companies. We've given them this gift of an identity and um, I think there's lots of, way, there are lots of ways in which we can say well, they, they're given that gift of identity and it is in some sense um, under God. And um, what that means in, remember I'm a canon theologian, so I kind of get a bit geeky in terms of my language, but I think that what, what that might mean is that the, um, you know, this corporate exercising of, of enterprise and competitiveness and those yes moments um, which I described, they're kind of a, a theological thing in some way. Um, most theologians are interested in, in other things like, I don't know, liturgy, usually sex actually, I'm afraid. You know, that's the, the church spends a lot of time talking about sex. Um, not quite sure why. I can guess, but there we are. But actually, I think um, theologians ought to be much more interested, and some are, thank goodness, um, in this whole theme of, of business and enterprise. And because I think it is a theological matter. Um, and that's, that's exciting for me. And I wrote something fairly modest two or three years ago um, about enterprise, God and enterprise, an attempt to work out a little bit more what enterprise might mean under God. Um, so that's why I'm excited to be here today. Um, thank you again, Barbara, for the invitation. Um, so I'm delighted that the Church Investors Group has been able to provide a bit of input. Um, and, it, it, and it's also why pieces of work such as this, um, the one being launched today, are actually so important. Um, uh, so important because they're part of this, this kind of bigger view, really, as to what um, business can be and do. In, in the world, in our communities. Um, and so, well, I'm excited to hear our next speaker and I'm excited to read the report properly. Um, and thank you again for inviting me and for listening to me. Thank you very much, Edward. Um, for those of you who don't know the Institute as well as, as some of you, we're known as a safe place to take and explore different points of view. And so I'm particularly delighted that Alex Edmonds from the London Business School has agreed to speak. Uh, for those of you who work in this field, you know he has a truly incredible trajectory as an academic um, and has done just amazing things for the time he has been in this field um, around this subject. And you will know his work, so I am absolutely delighted that he's here. Uh, having seen his slides in advance, I can promise you that uh, you're in for a treat, but I can also promise you, you might not agree with everything he says, and that's also good, because I think all of us need to be challenged in the way we think about this subject. Uh, and he was chosen because he thinks so uniquely on this subject, and not because he would necessarily agree with what was in our report. Alex?
Great. Well, I just want to start with some thank yous and also some apologies. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak. It's always a huge pleasure to get an invitation to, to share your viewpoints. Uh, but this is something which means a lot to me because I was actually baptised and confirmed in St Paul's Cathedral. I went to St Paul's School um, as a secondary school student. Uh, and the apology is I'd already accepted an invitation to speak again on executive pay uh, later this afternoon. It seems to be a pretty hot topic. So I normally, when I'm uh, invited to speak, I stay for the whole event. Number one, out of professional courtesy to the other speakers. But number two, I learn a lot from other people's viewpoints, as Barbara was suggesting. I'll try to stay at least for, 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 for as, as long as possible for, for the remainder, but I apologise if I, I have to duck in. Now, I agree with a lot in terms of the mission of, of what the um, report is, is trying to do. So to the extent to which there will be any disagreement, it will not be on the ultimate goal, but potentially on the journey on the best way to get there. In particular, I definitely agree with the goal of getting of, of fair pay for fair work for both chief executives but also for every worker within an organisation. For this, I'll start by the definition of, of what is fair. I'm going to get to some scripture later rather than here, but I'll, I'll just go through some of these points first. So fairness, I believe, and, and one might disagree with my, my definition, is, is pay which is merited by performance. So if you've performed well, then it's not unfair to be rewarded, even if the reason for performing well was not to get a bonus or not to get pay. You, you performed well because you wanted to make products that transform lives for the better. You, work, you worked hard in order to provide your employees with a healthy and enriching workplace. It's not unfair for somebody to be rewarded for that after the fact. And similarly, if you are being paid uh, relative to your performance, this also leads to accountability if you have not performed then you should indeed be accountable for that. And one immediate consequence of this is that fairness does not necessarily mean equality, although that's something that we should still be concerned about, as I'll get to later. So just as if I was to give all students the same grades on, on their class, that would be equal, but it might not necessarily be fair because they might perform quite differently in the exam or in class participation. So while I agree that fairness is very important, I believe that the most important dimension is pay which is linked to performance. And I believe that pay is indeed unfair in many cases because it is not linked to the correct measures of performance for a number of reasons. And I've only had a chance to skim through the report, but I agree with many of the concerns stated in the report. One of the reasons may well be that the measure of performance is, is short-term quarterly earnings, which is something that the canon just alluded to earlier, is that you're being paid for just hitting a particular target rather than creating value for society. If you're getting millions for that, that is absolutely unfair. You're paid for the wrong measure of performance. Or sometimes you might be paid for performance outside the manager's control, so maybe there was an upturn in economic conditions. Per Simon, the executives did extremely well because house prices were very high due to low interest rates. Was that due to the executives? Uh, likely not. That could again be said to be unfair. And also, it's a, it could be the wrong measure of performance because it might only take shareholders into account rather than other stakeholders, and I fully agree that companies have a responsibility not just to shareholders, even though shareholders are important, pension funds and the like, but also to society more generally. I think we should also change some of the dialogue as to pay, because we often refer to CEO pay as executive compensation. I think that's a really bad word. You get compensation for an injury. Right? So here, using the term compensation implies that an executive is lazy and the only reason that she's going to work hard is if you compensate her for the effort of working hard. And under that, you can clearly not justify high pay. A CEO's job is, is probably not harder than, say, a shift worker's job or, or many others' job, other people's jobs. So pay should not be seen as, as, as compensation for effort but instead reward for value for creation, for creating value for society over the long term. And the flip side of rewarding you for creating value is that you can be held accountable for failure to create value. And so when we think about, well, what should the uh, goal of, of reforming pay be? I'm going to contrast two mentalities here. So one I'm going to call the pie-splitting mentality. And this is the idea that an enterprise, a company, is, is a relatively fixed pie. And so the way in which we can create more value for stakeholders 
is by reducing the pay of the CEO. So one of the concerns is CEOs get paid so much more than the median worker. If she could be paid less, then there'd be more to redistribute around for workers, for customers, to reduce carbon emissions and the like. Now, that is indeed true, you could redistribute it, but the actual stake taken by executives is at the moment pretty small. So it's true that four million pounds, that is about 150 times what a worker gets, which seems massive, but compared to the overall firm size, that 0.05% of an eight billion pound firm, which is the average size of the FTSE 100. Now that's not to say that we can be blasé about the level of pay, right? Everything becomes small if you divide it by eight billion. But instead, it's to say that maybe that's not the most relevant dimension of pay. What matters is not so much redistributing the distribution of a fixed pie, but instead encouraging the executive to grow the pie. So this is what I call the pie growing mentality. If indeed the correct incentives are in place, based on long-term performance taking stakeholders into account, that could give the executives incentives to grow the pie and remove the disincentives for a lot of the short-term actions that we see, that could create many percentage points of, of shareholder and society of, of value. So that creates profits and also, in many cases, could also um, make employees and customers better off. Now, we can't just assume that that will happen automatically. Part of the responsibility of a company is to make sure that any product of pie growing does go to other stakeholders, but I believe that the first goal of the reform is in order to create long-term value to begin with. And so that's why I'm going to just bring a little bit of the scripture that I needed to, to early. Now, I apologise for many of you who, who will not manage Christian-based um, uh, investment foundations, but because this is linked to the Church Investments Group, this may well be important because I know that some investors would like to base their principles uh, on Christian values. So I'm going to just read a small extract um, from Matthew's Gospel, which is the parable of the talent. For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and another one, to each according to his ability. He went away. The one who'd received the five talents went at once and traded with them and made five more. The one who had two talents made two talents more. But the one who received the one talent dug it into the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master came back. And the one who said, had five talents said, Master, you gave me five. I've created five more. The master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will give you, um, set you over much. The one with two talents came forward and said, I've given you two more. His master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will give you more. He who received the one talent came forward, saying, I know that you are a hard man. You reap where you did not sow, and you gather where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid I hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But the master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you know that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. You ought to have invested my money, and I should have received what was my own with interest. Now we have to be extremely careful about quoting from the Bible, as one of my former pastors said, a text without a context is a pretext. So I know some people in the past have used this passage to, to, um, to justify inequality. So in, indeed, I did not read out the following two verses, which was, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents, for to everyone who has more will be given and he will have an abundance. He said, I'm not going to use this for that purpose. Instead, why I'm going to use this passage is that this emphasises the need to grow the pie. So this is about stewardship. The best thing that somebody you've given your resources to, so managers, they are given, they're put in charge of a company, the best thing that they can do is to create value for society. That's the five who gets five more. And one of the worst things that you can do is just not to innovate, just to stick to the status quo, just to coast. Because there's two types of errors. There's errors of omission, that's doing, that's not doing something good. And there's errors of commission, that's doing something bad. And I think some of the ways in which we hold companies to account is we focus much more on errors of commission, companies doing something bad, 
rather than areas of omission, failures to innovate, failures to grow the pie. So at the moment, maybe one of the worst things a CEO could do is be paid too much and maybe destroy up to 0.05% of firm value. But I think something which is far worse than that is an error of omission, failure to innovate, and that, as I will show you with evidence later, could reduce the pie by 4 to 10 percentage points. And then if when I talk about this, I am absolutely going to take into account the fact that an unequal distribution may well shrink the pie by demotivating colleagues, and so that's going to be an important channel which I cannot sweep under the carpet. Okay, so if indeed the goal is to change pace so that we're going to encourage pie growing, how are we going to do this? And so what I'm going to try and present here is, is just an overview of, of the approach that I'm going to take. So often when I am speaking on these pay conferences, I am um, cast as giving the academic perspective. And that causes people just to fall asleep for the next 20 minutes before the actual practitioners who actually know about these things uh, will, will come and present. But what I want to again highlight is that we're going after the same goal, which is to reform pay, but we're going to use different expertise. And you need of expertise is better than the other, but they're just complementary expertise. So this is not the opposite of practitioners. Instead, it's trying to use uh, three things in order to guide it. So number one is to use large-scale evidence. So a remuneration committee chair will know far more than I work will about any particular company. She will serve on, on, on that committee. Or investors, you will talk directly to remuneration committees in a way that I won't. And maybe you'll talk to dozens or even hundreds of companies. But what we can do as academics is we can look at what happens in thousands of companies across different industries, perhaps throughout the world, because to the extent to which you want to develop a set of principles, right, that might apply to any company that you might want to invest in. And we want to be sure that whatever remedies that we suggest are not just driven by a couple of uh, examples, but might be driven by the evidence in general. The next thing is that we need to be rigorous, is that you can have correlations from the data. But as we know, it's very difficult often to distinguish correlation from causation. That's one of the things that we're trying to do. The final thing is we'll try to be objective. So rather than starting with a viewpoint and trying to find sort of evidence to back that viewpoint, the goal, and not all academics do this, I agree, but the goal that what you should try to do is to form your opinions based on the strength of the evidence. And this is not to say that practitioners don't try to do this as well. It's just we have a different time frame. It often takes five years to publish an academic paper. So this gives us the time and space to really try to nail down a particular result. But again, there's a lot of caveats here. So there's a lot of bad academic evidence, which, which is not actually that rigorous. So we need to be careful about using the very best evidence, rather than an evidence that is going to support our viewpoints. And sometimes evidence can be misused, just like quotes from the Bible can be misused to, to support a particular um, viewpoint. And sometimes inconvenient truth, some, some evidence which does come up, they can be suppressed because they're, they're not uh, in accordance with a particular viewpoint. And so that's something I talked about in my TEDx talk last year, from post-truth to pro-truth about the correct use of evidence. And so what I want to start with is to try to address some of the myths that I see in, in, in compensation. And again, the goal of this is not to be destructive, it's to be constructive. In order to suggest a treatment to a problem, we need to make sure that we diagnose the problem in the first place. And so what I want to do is to diagnose what the problems are. I do believe pay absolutely should be reformed, but potentially on different dimensions to what people um, have up. Have I'm just going to look at it. So, um, sorry, before I get to that, just, this is just a couple of slides just to highlight the importance of, our, of academic research. So, there's a submission to Parliament um, in the Corporate Governance Inquiry which referred to a study which found that firm productivity is negatively correlated with the pay ratio between the CEO pay and worker pay. Now, what they did is they quoted a half finished study when the finished version was actually out. And the finished version actually found the opposite result. So when you've gone through peer review and corrected the mistakes, they actually found the opposite. High pay ratios were correlated with better performance. And that's absolutely not the last word on oh, this doesn't mean that pay ratios are a bad thing. Just like this would not have said that they were a good thing. Right? There could be many, many other reasons for why pay ratios could be desirable despite this evidence. 
All I'm saying here is that you can always find evidence to support a particular viewpoint. We must try to make sure that it's better. Similarly, just after that came a study in the Financial Times, not a study, sorry, an article in the Financial Times, uh, referred to a study which found that UK CEOs are overpaid and there was no link between pay and performance. But nobody had ever seen the study. That study actually didn't exist at the time. So what they've done was they, they based this on the press release of um, the people who've written the study. But we, we can't take these things at face value, just like if there was a medical trial showing that X cures cancer or X reduces heart disease, you'd like to be able to, 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 to vet this. And so this is why we want to be cautious, even though evidence is not everything, right, there's many other things to come in. To the extent to which we want to use evidence, we try to make sure that it is real. So just a couple of myths which I think are shooting at the wrong target before I get to some of the suggestions which are aligned with some of the things in the report. So there's one concern, that CEOs are not paid for performance. And indeed, if this concern were true, that would be a major concern if you believe my definition of fairness, which is it should be linked to performance, then it's not only really bad that CEOs are paid four million, but that four million is irrespective of whether you performed or not, and indeed this was something which I saw in the report, the concern that fat cats got off scot-free from the financial crisis. There's many pieces of evidence which supports this, and this was a study by MSCI, which shows that if you look at 10-year um, stock returns, so this is a long-term performance measure, there is virtually no relationship between the pay that the CEO receives and how she's performed. However, the concern with this is what they do is they look at how much your salary and your bonus changes every year with performance. Indeed, they don't change much, so that suggests that you're unaccountable. But what this does is this ignores the vast majority of a CEO's incentives, which comes from the fact that she owns a lot of stock in her own company. And that leads to great sensitivity uh, to performance. Indeed, what you find is that a 10% fall in the stock price reduces the CEO's pay by 1.5 million in the UK, at least pre-tax. So they are exposed to changes in performance, so they are held account. The second concern here, is that incentives don't work or CEOs don't matter. So there's quite a lot of evidence in other fields that if you give somebody incentives, this backfires, right? If you give teachers incentives based on test scores, they will teach to the test and they won't cover other things such as the love of learning and, and discipline and a respectful authority. And certainly the concern here is that if you're to pay CEOs according to just financial performance measures, they're going to be focusing just on that measure and ignore other stakeholder dimensions. And I think that concern is actually very valid for many types of um, CEO pay structures which are based narrowly on things such as quarterly earnings or hitting any particular financial target. However, there is one type of, of, of incentive scheme which does, um, which is uh, immune to some of those concerns, which is payment according to the long-term stock price. In many years' time, this might be seven years or even longer than that. Why is that? Well, there's evidence that the long-term stock price takes into account not just shareholders, but your performance on many other stakeholder dimensions. For example, one of my own studies shows that if you treat your work as well, this leads to outperformance, although it takes the stock market about five years before it recognises this, so this means it's important to have this long horizon. If you're treating your customers well, this also leads to long-term outperformance, measures of environmental stewardship. That's the value that your products create compared to the waste. That also shows up in the long-term stock. And then other things that you can do to cheat, such as accounting manipulation. If you manipulate your accounts and you have to restate them afterwards, your stock price goes down by 9%. So things that you can do in the short term to hit particular targets, that worsens the performance in the long term. And so in terms of does this actually work long-term stock price performance, what I, what I saw in this um, um, uh, report here was a reference to William Lazonic, who claimed that harmful effects have resulted from CEOs' pay intrinsically linked to employer stock prices. 
I don't know of evidence shown that's the case as long as we're having long-term stock prices. I know that they, this was referenced um, an article in Harvard Business Review, which is not a peer-reviewed uh, publication. I didn't know that that had that um, quote in it, but I know that the Harvard Business Review article is very famous for the following statistic. It says that CEOs spend too much money on stock buybacks because 90% of net income is used for buybacks rather than investments. But that statistic is misleading because net income is already after deducting R&D expenditure and advertising expenditure and all of those other expenditures. But that statistic has been very commonly quoted even though it's meaningless because net income is after investment. So again, we might want to be a bit concer a concerned before taking that um, claim at face value. So let's look at one paper here which looks at the benefits of having a CEO be paid like an owner rather than like a bureaucrat. So what they show is they look at companies where CEOs have a lot of stock in their own firm and companies where CEOs have little stock in their own firm. And they found that the companies where CEOs are paid like owners beat the ones where CEOs are paid like bureaucrats by 4 to 10 percentage points per year in the long term. Now one may be sceptical and say, well, is this correlation or is this causation? Maybe a CEO knows that her company's going to do well, then she goes to the board and says, oh, give me stock rather than cash. And if the CEO knew that her company was going to do badly, she might say, oh, just give me cash rather than stock. And so causation is the other way, and we need to be concerned about that. So what they show, in order to show that incentives actually cause the CEO to, to act in a particular way with the pie, they said, well, incentives should work particularly in contexts where there's a lot of tendency perhaps to shirk, to post and to preserve the status quo, this is where product market competition is weaker, this is where institutional investors are not monitoring, and this is where governance is generally weak, they found that this effect was, was strong. Now even though they look at long-term stock returns, you might say, still, well, I'm not, I don't believe these early studies show that this was related to stakeholder outcomes. So this study here looks directly at stakeholder outcomes in addition to um, financial outcomes. So they look at implementing long-term incentives. This cause is not just higher profitability, but higher innovation of high growing activity, and higher performance on four um, student stakeholder dimensions, customers, employees, suppliers, and society, with it particularly being strong on the employee dimension. Again, it suggests that if you're going to get a CEO a stake in the long-term firm value, she knows that she's going to be accountable for creating long-term firm value, and this requires you to invest in your stakeholders, not just pursue short-term profit targets. And so this goes into what I think to be the main way in which pay should be reformed, and this, I believe, is very much aligned with, I think, as principle two, which is about simplifying pay packages. So, at the moment, many, many pay packages are not based on long-term stock price performance, but particular financial targets. And so this is how, how it might work. It might be that um, you have to take four pounds, this could be revenues, profits, this could be stock price, let's call it profit. Once you hit four pounds, you get a uh, bonus. And then the bonus rises, the more profitable you come, and then it maxes out after a particular point, which is the eight pounds. Now, one of the problems with this is that, well, if your performance was going to be just less than four pounds, what would you do? You could cut research and development to increase your, your pay. You could reduce employee wages, fire some employees, you could do a lot of manipulation in order to get the bonus paying off. And so this is a big concern here, right? You give CEOs a huge incentive to meet this four pound threshold, when investors, right, they benefit from the company doing better, but there's nothing magic about this four pound number. So we're giving CEOs massive incentives to get above four pounds, when this is something that investors in society don't really benefit. And they'll feel you then cap it at eight pounds at the top, which also might be a concern, because if you're like up here, right, you've already got a good company, you might just play it safe and not innovate, because if you do better, nothing happens. But if you do worse, you're going to have the fall. And what we want as a society is not good companies. We want great companies. 
So Google, for example, they were already a good company, but they decided to go one better and restructure to Alphabet and launch self-driving cars and to launch Pixel to take Apple's iPhone on at their biggest product, and that's what we'd like to do. But here, we're just encouraging the executives to play games, hit this target, and just coast when you get here. And also, how do we know what these targets should be? This is a lot of the concerns that people have, is that we set targets which are too easy. And we don't like the fact that a CEO often gets a bonus for just showing up to the office when ordinary workers don't get a bonus for just doing their job. So this also leads to concerns. And also the concerns are, well, what is this? Profit? There's so many ways to measure profit. Is it return on sale, return on assets, return on equity? Is it before or after extraordinary items? There is evidence that people will manipulate the, um, the, the targets afterwards um, to satisfy. So this huge complexity leads to a lot of problems, and this is a recent study in the top journal showing that this behaviour happens, that you, you take actions to be just above a target. So by me saying this, this is not scaremongering, this is unfortunate what executives do. So what's the remedy for this? I think it's simplicity. Um, although I, here I'll, I'll have slightly different views from number two, it says rein in stock based pay. Stock -based pay. But I believe that stock-based pay here does achieve simplicity. So if you give them stock with that, say, a seven-year performance horizon, it could be even longer than that, this leads to a number of things. Number one, there's simplicity. Right? You're giving stock. You don't need to choose what is the measure of profit that you're going to use. You don't need to choose things like these thresholds. You're paying the CEO like an owner. You're giving her stock in her own firm. There's transparency. But you know what the CEO is going to be paid on in accordance with. That's the long-term stock price performance. BP's Bob Dudley, his pay was not transparent because after the stock price fell by 15%, he was being paid 14 million and many investors and, and citizens didn't know why this was the case when he'd apparently underperformed. It's also leads to sustainability if you indeed have the stock price being something seven or more years out. So one of my recent studies shows that when a CEO's equity is about to vest, they cut R&D in order to meet short-term earnings targets. And so again, this is why I suggest, well, when we want to reform pay, what matters is the effect on the CEO's actions, perhaps more than ratios and other things, it's the effect on what they It leads to accountability. So what you can also have is the CEO's, uh, is the stock um, stays locked in the firm, even after the CEO has left. But in many cases, often CEOs can cash out when they leave. The countrywide CEO, Andrew Mizzillo, he made $129 million by selling his shares just before the financial crisis, which indeed is an example of fat caps getting off stock free. You as investors, right, you, you often, well, you'd like to hold your shares for the long term. You'd like CEOs to have a horizon beyond their tenure within the company, and so that's something that I think can, can be put into place. Well, this is a very important thing here. It's symmetry. It's that this should be given to employees as well, potentially. Because if companies do well, it's probably not just down to the CEO. She's one of many, many workers in the firm. It's employees who contributed to this, and by giving them some stock as well, they can benefit from, from, from the upturn. If you're giving CEOs these complicated bonuses, you can't give those to employees um, as well. You might give them shares, but then it might be one more for the CEO and another more for everybody else, because it could be that these complex bonuses pay off, even if the stock price didn't, um, as is the case of, of Bob Dudley. Now, there are a lot of concerns that I've heard about this movement towards restricted stock and movement away from these bonus things. And so just to end before um, uh, wrapping up, is to try to address well, why, why these concerns might not be as concerning as one might think. So one thing I can say is that, well, if you're paying for the according to the stock price in seven years' time, she doesn't know what to do to improve the stock price in seven years' time. That's just too far out. If you give her these bonuses that she can hit, she knows what to do to hit those targets. But that's precisely the point. You don't want an incentive scheme which gives the CEO particular targets that she knows how to manipulate to hit. Instead, by freeing her from these short-term targets, you're allowing her just to focus on creating value on the company's identity, as the company was suggesting. 
you can free her to, to fulfill the purpose of the company, which is to make products that transform customers' lives for the better, to preserve the environment for future generations. Now, she knows that if she indeed creates value, after the fact, she might be rewarded for that. But the reason for creating value was not in order to get paid for it a lot later, it's because she's intrinsically driven by the mission of the company. At the moment, something like this is constraining rather than freeing because she's distracted from creating value and instead focusing on hitting startups. Another concern here is, well, it encourages greed. Right? We don't want a CEO who's only going to be working for the company because she knows she's going to be paid off in, in seven years' time. But I turn this a bit on a set, so it's that's absolutely true. We want people to be intrinsically motivated. I work in a profession where we get no bonuses at all, right? So we are just working basically because we like teaching and research. And if indeed it was the case that a CEO was not intrinsically motivated, the solution is not to give her some shares to motivate her, it's to get a different CEO. You want somebody who's intrinsically working for the firm. But instead it's to lead to accountability, right? If indeed it happens that the CEO hasn't created value, and maybe investors have lost the money, workers have been fired and so on. If the CEO was given cash salary, she would have got that salary anyway. But if her pay is tied to a long-term performance, that leads to some, some accounts of it. Another concern here, I'm not going to go over everything, is that the CEOs get their shares for free, regardless of performance, whereas at least here, you can take those shares away if she doesn't hit this four pound target. But this is, depends on the implementation. You're not going to give the shares for free to the executive. So instead of, say, giving one million of cash, you might give half a million of cash and half a million of shares. So any shares that you're giving is going to be accompanied by a reduction in cash. And in fact, if you're going to split between this and shares which are not based on hitting thresholds, you should produce the number of shares that you give the CEO because you know that they're going to be guaranteed and like in this case. So this is quite similar to something I've heard Daniel Godfrey suggest, which is to give CEOs cash and make them buy shares in their firm, which again, we're very much aligned, we want CEOs to be long-term owners and accountable. Why I prefer to give them the shares and have reduced their cash pay rather than give them cash and make them buy shares is that if you give them cash and allow them to buy shares, there's evidence showing that they will time the purchase of the shares to be just after negative news releases and so on. Again, we want to reduce gaming, we want to just free CEOs just to focus on creating long-term value, so they're for, for shares to be awarded directly and paid for by a reduction in cash salary is the easiest way to do this. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, I completely agree with the goal of reform, which should be to make pay fair, but I think the most important dimension is to encourage pie growing, to make sure she is take action to grow the pie for society. I think the biggest way a CEO can take and steal from society is not necessarily just by buying pay too much, but by just destroying social value, by taking these actions to hit these short-term targets. CEO should be paid by long-term owners, not bureaucrats, for all of these mentions that reasons I mentioned. I haven't mentioned equality much because just for the lack of time. I think equality is, is very important. We can't just grow the pie without concerns about distribution and society is getting very unequal. But inequality is not just caused by 100 public FTSE 100 CEOs. It's caused by high paid many other professions. Top lawyers, CEOs of private firms, maybe financial professionals who are not at the top level, even people in the entertainment and sporting industry, they pay a lot. Something like a higher income tax after a particular level, that's something that I, I believe could address the quality concerns which come from not just CEOs, but many of these other highly paid professions. And I think that could address the quality in a more systematic way than just targeting CEOs, who could be part of the problem, but are not the entire problem. Thank you very much for everybody's attention. Um, thank you. Lily, do you have questions? Um, sure, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, I'll ask anybody else, but I... Um, how do you feel about stock options mm. versus stock? Yeah. Because it seems to me there's a lot of trouble with the stock options. Yeah. 
Um, I agree with the concern with stock options which was raised in this report. So the problem with, with stock options is that, let's say you give an option with a strike price of 40, you give massive incentives to get it above 40, and um, you're not punished if it's below 40. So if the stock price is 39, you take gambles in order to, to increase um, the, the volatility. And again, if you're a long-term investor, you care about the stock price being 39 versus 30. But if you give an option, the CEO is completely insensitive to that. And so one of the reasons why options are so popular, particularly in the US, is nothing to do with this being helpful for long-term value, but pure accounting manipulation. So it used to be under FAS123, you could expense any op you didn't need to expense any option which was granted at the money. So you could give CEOs a lot of options and this didn't cost anything in accounting earnings. After that was changed in 2006, option pay was reduced. So that was showing that this was not actually something implemented to create societal value, but in order to reduce the accounting, the accounting hit. I'll let you choose your questions. Oh, yeah, sure, go ahead, sir. Yeah, so um, you touched upon absolute mm. performances mm. of pay. Mm. So you're saying you get four or eight, yeah. but the other way uh, investors are uh, unstable, so looking at the mm. Relative yeah. Mm. It's about how you uh, rank alongside the other companies within your business. Mm. Mm. Um, what are the pitfalls of looking at a uh, relative performance uh, measures? That, that's a very good point. So when you go back to the uh, uh, restricted stock, so there, there are debates, and I, I'm actually not sure which way I fall on this debate. You could just give it absolute, or you should give it relative to the rest of the companies in the industry. So one of the arguments for giving it relative to other companies in the industry is that you'd like to isolate what's down to the CEO. So if a Simon was paid compared to other people in, 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 in property, then that would take out anything due to house prices rising. The argument that I hear for the flip side is that it just should be it should have absolute performance is, well, if indeed the industry suffers a downturn, investors are losing, employees are losing their jobs, and if you allow the CEO to get a scot free by saying, well, you've actually not done that badly relative to your industry, that could lead to perceptions of, of unfairness. So I think there's arguments for both ways. The most important thing to do is to make sure that what you do is symmetric. Unfortunately, another concern with executive pay is this asymmetry. There's evidence showing that if there is something positive outside the CEO's control, she is paid for it. When there's bad luck outside her control, she's insulated for it. So sometimes you're just you're you're basically heads you heads I win, tails you lose. So whatever is done should be symmetric rather than the current practice. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, would you advocate using sort of like pure restricted shares mm -hmm. with some kind of mm -hmm. and if you use that as well, mm -hmm. Yes, so my view, and then again this is something that people might disagree with, so I sit on the steering group of the Purposeful Company with Claire Chapman who's just implemented this within Weir Group, and um, I believe that you should not have an underpin. Why? Because the choice of this, as you're suggesting, is, is arbitrary, and if you're not hitting the underpin, you're going to take a lot of downfalls. Again, we want to give you something which is as closely aligned to what long-term investors get, which is something which is linear. Um, well, Claire's concern was, well, uh, you, you might be giving the CEO something for, for failure. You'd like to be able to take the, the shares away. My response to that was, you should just give fewer shares to begin with, because if you're giving something guaranteed, that's something that's going to be worth more, so you should reduce the amount of shares to begin with. Um, and so my view is that you shouldn't have an underpin at all. You want to give something as close as possible to what long-term investors can. Okay. There's a question from the gentleman back. Yeah, it's just a this seems to be a problem for such a long time, yeah. and probably one of the other members here. I remember people like yourself way back in the 60s mm -hmm. saying very similar things mm -hmm. about short term investments. Mm -hmm. One might have thought that somehow, yes, through academia, yeah. uh, you know, some kind of solutions might have been found. Mm -hmm. This seems a bit disappointing. Yes, I agree with you. I think some, some, some of the reasons was to the question is why is it taking so long for this problem that we've known about for a while to, to be addressed. So what is actually the evidence previously that would look at some correlations? It's only now that we're actually getting causal evidence that these things actually happen. And, and another is sometimes regulation might actually um, have been poorly designed and led to the problem being, get, get it worse. So it might be well-intentioned regulation poorly designed led to an exacerbation. For example, in 1982, there's a guy called William Agee, the CEO of Bendix, who was giving a huge golden parachute after his company was taken over. 
And then Congress was really happy about that and said, oh, we should stop golden parachutes. Let's make sure they're no more than three times the average salary. What did this lead to? Other people noticed, what? There's something called a golden parachute. You can actually get paid for being fired. So many CEOs just adopted the golden parachute, even though they never had one to begin with. And this three times thing was something which was seen as a sanction. So people who had golden parachutes below three times salary actually increased it to three times salary. So this is why I, I, I want to be a bit concerned with regulation, because even if it is actually quite well intentioned, it might backfire. So we need to be careful about diagnosing it with, with evidence. That's, yeah, go ahead. I was interested at the beginning when you were talking about fairness. You yeah. voted for the power of the, of the talents. Mm -hmm. What do you make of the parable of the labourers in the vineyard? Where this is are made the same, yeah. whatever their contribution is. For those don't know, who don't know this, this is where some, some labourers were, were paid, were hired for the whole day and some were hired for the last two hours and every got paid, paid the same there. So again, it might be that people will have different readings of this. My, my, my interpretation of this is that this is about envy. So, so what um, the, the, the uh, person paying was rebuking it was the fact that the jealousy, the fact that, okay, somebody has worked um, shorter hours than me, but is actually being paid just as much as me. And so that's some of the concerns that I have around the, the, the pay ratio is that this is looking at your comparison with, with other people. And so this, is, this was a parallel about envy um, rather than necessarily about not being paid for performance. Also, what that was about was compensation for effort, whereas what I'm arguing is it should be for value creation. And indeed, the efforts they put in were quite different in, in, in that case. And then what we see in reality is, is it's not the hardest jobs that get paid more, what matters is the value which is created from the jobs. Um, yeah, Daniel, and then we'll just take one. Yeah. Um, you, you didn't mention anything perhaps because of my, about the impact this might have on the boards yeah. in terms of their relationship to CEOs. Mm. Uh, and it seems to me that what you're proposing would give boards much clearer responsibility and accountability for performance management, mm -hmm. which has been sort of transferred to these very complicated uh, bonus structures. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think just if, if you're making these decisions simpler, simpler then this will, so there's some boards and even some, some investors I've talked to say, we are sick about all, all these conversations always having to be about pay. Pay is important, but there's many other things which are important, which is how are you treating your workers, are you innovating, are you reducing your carbon emissions, and, and so on. And so by reducing a, a lot of these concerns, which is, oh, should this be here or, or here, the only thing you really need to decide is how many shares do you need to give the CEO? Perhaps should you give an underpin? And should the best in period be, be seven years or ten years? So the, the question, but by making uh, that that job easier, that, that that allows more time to be done on other things. Who else might lose here? Is compensation consultants might lose because like, these problems actually become um, simpler. But what's interesting is that one of the people behind this, and I saw was quoted in the report, is Tom Gosling of PwC, who I work with on the personal company, and and, and he's he, he's not concerned with, with with that. He just wants pay structures to be in society's interests, and he argues that a lot of the complexity, even though this leads to compensation consultants being in high demand, is not necessary in society's interests. At the back, gentlemen, I've got a question. Yeah, James Roberts, CCI. A very simple question. Sure. I wonder if you looked at the effects of moving back to almost a fixed base, so moving back to focus on salary, almost exclusively, and that you would have a very different effect on the To completely fix it. Yeah. yeah, so this, this goes back to. Um, this study here, which looks at CEOs which are paid in, in fixed pay rather than equity pay, and this underperformed by four to ten percent per year. To the extent that you watch want you want something fixed um, and maybe not dependent on the stock price, one thing I saw in the report which I fully agree with is it was debt-based compensation, and that was actually one of my earlier uh, papers. Um, in the US, you have CEOs with defined benefit pensions where if the company goes bankrupt then the pension is, is eroded as, as well. So we might not have some situations that we, we had here in, in the UK. And so that has shown to reduce the cost of debt and lead to the lower prob probabilities of bankruptcy and the like. Why? Because the CEO is now held accountable for performance in bankruptcy, whereas equity, given limited liability, which, which uh, was focused on earlier, that's insensitive to the severity of, of bankruptcy. Thank you very much for everyone's attention and questions. Ask some questions. So the person I don't envy is the next speaker, because you've got to follow him. <laughs> Stefan Stern, who most of you here will know, um, 
has been a journalist who I've read for years and until very recently was head of the High Pay Center. And I've asked him to talk about his own possibly more anecdotal perspective about why we haven't succeeded, as the gentleman asked, in trying to do this reform since the 1960s. Um, and I'm not even going to try and turn that off because I'm going to blow it. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, very, it's very good to, to be here. Uh, why is this such a difficult question? Um, well, Mike Betts, of whom before this morning I had not heard, uh, is the chief executive of a company, a, a charitable organization, not-for-profit company, uh, called Motability. And uh, Motability does a very important job of providing uh, vehicles for people with disabilities, people who can't get around so easily uh, around the country. It's a monopoly provider. They receive two billion pounds a year effectively from us, from taxpayers, in the form of, dis of benefit payments to those people who require these vehicles. Uh, and there's an arrangement with big four uh, lending banks to arrange these payments. So it's a monopoly uh, provider with a direct uh, taxpayer, substantial taxpayer subsidy. Uh, Mr. Betts got paid 1.7 million pounds a year uh, for running Motability last year. His pay has gone up enormously even in the past few years. And Hatton has gone now, but this, the point really is, 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 is the systemic problem. And I think what, what the psychologists call anchoring of very, very big numbers. Um, people have got used to hearing about very, very big numbers. I agree with Alex that compensation is a rather dubious word to use. Uh, and the Latinate, sorry to the classicists in the room, but Latin is often a clue that something slightly fishy is going on. Uh, quantum is a worse example in this world of high pay. We use this word quantum as a, a terrible euphemism for avoiding talking about how much people are actually getting, because that's what quantum means, it refers to quantity, of course. I always think that if you put a question mark, I mean, quantus, I think, would be the word in Latin, questioning word in Latin. If you put quantus with a question mark, you would actually be saying, how much? So when people say quantum, I think, how much? Uh, the problem is that these take-home pay figures have got much, much, much bigger over the past 20. I can't go back to the 60s, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, well, I mean, I do, literally, but not in my living memory. Um, and uh, I mean, at the, the moment, I think most of us became more aware of this matter as a, as a problem was in the mid-1990s when uh, British gas was privatized and good old Cedric Brown, who'd been a lifetime uh, employee of the company, and much admired, much liked person, I believe, who was one day went home to bed and was managing director of the gas board, as we used to call it, and the next day was the chief executive of a FTSE 100 company. And it was decided that a FTSE 100 chief executive company should get paid a lot more than what the managing director doing exactly the same job the day before of a nationalised industry should get paid. So it paid doubled almost immediately, and that was where if you remember the campaign about Cedric the Pig came from, a GMB campaign, and, and that was the first real howl of outrage about fat cats in executive pay and snouts in the trough. And it's been a 20 plus year saga with um, some progress along the way, some reforms. Um, 2013, the Vince Cable reforms, which led to greater transparency. Uh, on top pay with, of course, as Alex also said, the unintended consequence perhaps that more comparisons were made and more ratcheting up of pay was made. Again, that is an anecdotal point, but the tales of people saying, well, if that idiot's on six million, I want eight, and so on. So there was a short-term hit, hit with more transparency. And we await the legislation on uh, pay ratios, which I agree are a, a simple measure and not a magic answer, but I think will be helpful in, in applying more downward pressure on top pay because it will be more public. But it is a systemic problem. There's been no effective countervailing force in the room, these committees called remuneration committees. It's a rather rarefied gathering of people. There's no one in the room on less than a six-figure salary, for example. 
Um, so again, no one really is asking how much in the way that an ordinary employee, we heard a bit about employees, would ask when they hear these numbers. That's one big change I think that does need to come. We need employee representatives involved in part of this process and that hasn't been the case uh, in this country for, um, uh, well, ever really. Um, so it's a system that's really out of control. We, we heard some mention of, of greed and uh, this is the right place to have this sort of conversation because ultimately we, we really are talking about moral choices. Um, let me also just grapple a little bit with this business of share prices. I think we're placing far, far too much weight on the share price as an instrument or a vehicle or as, or as an indicator of something that we can use on, to base uh, executive pay on. I think it's a rather, well, Alex hinted at it, but I think it's actually a rather fanciful notion to draw a line between the individual contribution of someone called chief executive and a share price, certainly over the short to medium term possibly over the long term too. Our share prices are what we have as the vehicle to invest in companies um, and that's, that's unavoidable. But I think tying pay to the share price, clearly over the short to medium term, even over the long term I think is due because I'm much more in sympathy with the idea of fixed pay and more effective performance management from boards and if someone's doing a bad job they should be fired and if someone's doing a good job they should collect their salary which had been agreed in their contract. Um, we place uh, an almost, well, can I say mystical belief in, uh, in, the, in this tying of the individual to the share price which reflects the, not only the performance of the company and all its employees, but clearly reflects the business cycle, reflects geopolitical events, the commodity price cycle, uh, innovations, regulatory change. The share price moves about for all sorts of reasons that are completely beyond the control of the board of companies and certainly beyond the control of one human being called uh, chief executive. Actually, almost the inverse of what Alex suggested is true as far as employees and other stakeholders are concerned, certainly in the short to medium term. We've all seen the stock market reaction to announcements of large scale redundancies or big mergers that also have implications for employees and perhaps for the, employer, the environment and other suppliers and other stakeholders. The stock market loves big deals. They love big, bold moves like that, which have often very poor implications for the stakeholders that Alex was referring to. So over the short to medium term, I think I'm afraid the opposite of what Alex is saying is more likely to be the case. Um, so again, this is the share price as the ho sort of holy measure of, of performance, whereas I think actually if we had boards that were assessing uh, executives' contribution uh, rigorously, objectively, with a range of measures, including the share price, and having the, the courage, the discretion, as we ask from boards and directors, uh, I think we'd be in a healthier situation. But there has been this ratchet effect there doesn't appear to be much end to it in sight, unfortunately. This is what pay ratios will do. It will introduce uh, embarrassment, uh, can I even use the word shame, back into this conversation because people are going to have to start justifying it. And, and let me say as a journalist, of course, we too play a big part in this, not a good one when we talk about CEOs, a bit like football managers, a bit like superstars. Uh, as if they somehow are, we use, even use the verb to run the company. But you know, CEOs do not really run the company. They don't do the work. If you think of a big company, and we heard about sales and you know, the disciplines of competition, who's actually dealing with customers? Who's actually doing the research and development? Who's actually managing the supply chain? Who's actually making sure that people get paid? Well, the answer to all those questions is not the CEO. The CEO is obviously ultimately accountable, ultimately responsible. That's a very big and important job. They are administrators. They are actually inevitably bureaucrats, we, which the word is used sort of pejoratively on that slide, but it's not necessarily a, a negative thing to be a bureaucrat. They are administrators. They're not necessarily entrepreneurs. They're not founders. They're not at risk in the way that perhaps people actually in private equity or in hedge funds are at risk. 
And but I do accept Alex's point that we, we focus so much on FTSE 100 CEO pay packages because it's the ones where we've got the data. And it's true, there is a whole world of high pay, unseen, unreported going on. And it's, it's unfortunate to beat up on public companies because, as I say, we need to have the trading shares so that we can invest in them for our, our pensions and insurance policies. That is the system we've got, and I don't see any end to that in the short term. Um, no, no, it's, it's been a very, very knotty problem, but partly because we've been squeamish about the moral and the ethical conversation, and we haven't called out greed. And, it's, and, and when we have done, it's only been called out perhaps in a rather raucous, crude way, which sounds like envy. It's not about envy. It's about a world where someone running a monopoly charity, getting two billion a year of taxpayer subsidy, is getting paid 1.7 million pounds a year. Cedric's salary in 1995 shot up from about 200,000 pounds a year to 400,000 pounds a year. And that caused outrage uh, in 1995. So this is just ratcheted up and up and up. And we see it through parts of the public sector. We see it with certain university vice chancellors. It's not the quantum, it's not the figure, it's the relativity, it's the gap, and it's that sense that this has not been earned. They get paid it, they haven't earned it. And we haven't seen evidence of significant contribution. From a corporate government's point of view, of course, well, clearly CEOs should not be taking decisions on their own. Clearly big decisions in public companies and in other organisations are taken at board level through a process of discussion and agreement, agreement and disagreement before agreement is finally reached. So again, the idea that the CEO should be receiving such a disproportionately large pay package for decisions that are taken ultimately collectively seems to me a real uh, logical nonsense and a fairy tale. And we're all guilty of it because we don't study companies and the work that's going on in them carefully enough. We just talk about these heroic swashbuckling CEOs who, in quotation marks, turn companies around like Atlas, another bit of mythology, sort of carrying the whole weight of the earth on their shoulders and turning a company around as if one human being can turn a company around. I think leadership is very important. I've just written a short book about leadership that's about to be published. I don't, I, I don't discount leadership. I realise it's important. But I think these, in particular, share price link pay packages do so much to uh, hype up the individual contribution of one person and it's not healthy and the terrible consequences of that, this almost hero worship of CEOs, we see all around us, and not just in PLCs, as I say, but right through the economy, right through society. We want people going to want to make a contribution in life. We want to put more in than they take out. There's too much emphasis on big rewards, not enough on what people are actually doing to make our, our lives better. Thanks. Thanks. All right, now I'm going to have to see if I can figure out how to make this work. Ah, oh, there we go. Um, I was going to say that I'm going to briefly talk about the conclusions in this report, which you will have um, in the copies in front of you. But I do want to save a little bit of time for Stefan and Ken and Edward and myself to to be up here together, because what I would really like is to make all of you work a bit on um, what we do to make this happen. So that it's not just about us talking to you, it's also you talking to us, and especially because I know Wanda's in the audience and she has some of the next work to do on this subject, thinking collectively on how we make the changes is gonna be really important. So this is just to briefly tell you how we did this, and I've mentioned some of it. We tried to go through the history of pay and its increases, and sadly not many decreases. We looked at some of the academic work, we looked at some of the policy work. We also tried to compare measures in different jurisdictions to see what had worked elsewhere and what hadn't. One of the things that came out of this that was quite interesting to me was that culturally, uh, this is a big deal and it's a different deal in different countries because different countries are willing to talk about the subjects of earnings differently. So if we were in Sweden, all our pay 
would, all our tax returns would be on a website where our neighbors could know exactly how much we earned and exactly how much tax we paid. I don't think that would go down really well here if somebody would try and institute that. We're much more private about those subjects. So you do have to take the cultural context into, into account, but taking that cultural context into account in what is increasingly globalized share markets and globalized employment markets, particularly for the chief executive, becomes then very difficult because you can jurisdiction shop about where you want to work and where you want to get your CEO from and how much you want to disclose. So based on that, we wrote a draft paper, which two working roundtables of experts dissected such that we ripped it up and started over. Um, but it was a very fruitful experience because we knew a lot and we didn't give you the benefit of having to read all that we learned that wasn't all that useful. And what you have in front of you is much more of an essay that talks about how we got to our thinking and to try to make the conclusions as short and snappy and simple as possible because one of the things we were told in the first report is we were trying to do too much, uh, which was probably true. And the more recommendations you had, the less likely any of them were to be followed. So the reason I asked Stefan to talk is that huge amounts have been written on this, but there hasn't been very much change. And our own view of why there hasn't been much change is that there's some pretty strongly vested interests in not having change who are quite powerful people. And the cultural issue makes it difficult to have a universal position. Investors have been perhaps poorly mobilized or perhaps more worried about other things, understandably, because in the relative scheme of things, this is not the thing they need to watch most. And what we saw was that there is public indignation, but there's public indignation on a case-by-case -case basis. And it makes the news for a couple of days, and maybe it causes a little bit of a stir, and then it goes away until the next guy gets some ginormous package. So what we tried to do is we tried to come up with, as I say, short and snappy recommendations uh, at one of the roundtables, and I, I won't say it's our best work, but we tried to write a Dear CEO letter, which was what you might think you want to write to the CEOs of these companies. And it's not perfect, believe me, uh, but it was at least a stab at it. Uh, you know, if Larry Fink can write it to his, you know, his CEOs and every year, and if Jamie Dimon can do one, why can't we? Um, and it may at least give you some grounds to think about what you might want to say to a CEO on this subject. But most of all, what we're interested in is how we follow this up to make change happen. And that's where I'd really like the discussion after this presentation. So I will briefly go through the recommendations. Um, we would like to see the pay ratio published. Not everybody believes the gender gap is a direct comparable, but I will tell you, I actually sit on the board of a bank, and we had two full board meetings on our gender gap um, paper before it was published because we knew that we couldn't just put it out. We had to say what we were gonna do about it. Were we happy with it? What were the steps we were gonna take to change it? And, what, and, and the worst thing for us is because the exercise of options is included, next year it's gonna look even worse because the share price has gone up. There are not many women, and those guys that have those options are gonna exercise them next year, and the gender pay gap is gonna get worse next year. And there's not much we can do about it, but we have to put a plan in place. We know we have to put a plan in place to improve that, and so it's forced us to change. Um, I was fascinated to hear Alex because I do think we've made an industry out of compensation and particularly out of long-term incentive plans, LTIPs. I mean, there are people in most firms who do nothing, in most investment firms who do nothing but analyze LTIPs. Um, and they are complicated in a way that no individual investor can understand. I mean, I was trying, I'll be perfectly honest, I've been in stock options plans. I was trying to explain a stock options plan to one of my staff, and she looked at me like I was speaking Greek. Because I was, because it was all about deltas and change, and you know, I was speaking Greek. And, and how do we expect people to be able to critique things that even those that hold them can barely understand? So I think that simplification is, is critical. 
I also think, having done a tiny bit of arithmetic in my day, that it's easier to change the bottom half of the ratio than the top half. So maybe we should just raise the pay of the people at the bottom to make the ratio better. Um, I think that might make a big difference. Obviously, that has an impact because there are more people at the bottom. But I think, overall, that will be a less disruptive pay. Because one of the things that worried me in the looking at this is actually there are a lot of CEOs that get compensated for reducing the overall wage bill. So they make more the more people they get rid of or the less they pay them. Now that's a kind of perverse incentive if we're all looking for a society where everybody gets treated fairly to actually make the executives get paid better to the extent they can make the junior staff worse off. And that is a whole different paper another bid. <laughs> um, and then the last one is, and I, I confess, you know, there are two more of these. One is the, the next layer multiple, which is not an original idea. We took it from somebody else, but it's a really interesting idea where you have to show your pyramid and what the bands are and how much more the next band up makes compared to the band below. And what we found, and I'll go into a little more detail on this later, it actually cuts out what, what they found is it actually cut out whole layers because people realized there were ridiculous numbers of supervision layers in companies. And it, you ended up with a flatter, fairer management structure when you start doing this. And the fifth recommendation we also stole shamelessly, which is the fair compensation network. And is, as in many things with running a good company, Unilever is one of the first examples for this. You can find on their website their fair compensation framework that tells you exactly how they think about pay and exactly how they act on it. And that basically brings you back to the first one, which is why you want a pay ratio, because it forces people to talk about why that difference is and where they think value is created in the firm. Because either four, which is the interior salary multiples, or one, and certainly five, all require you to think about who is adding value and where that value is added in the firm. And that's a very salutary exercise for any chief executive. So I have um, a little bit on each one, and I won't spend a lot of time on them because I'd like to get to the discussion. The only thing I'll say on recommendation one, and this came out of the round tables and was quite interesting, I think not only should you be publishing that pay ratio, but you should be looking at the increases that are given by level in the company each year. So who's getting the largest incremental share of any increase in profitability in that company? Because that forces you again to think about where value is at. So how is the incremental value being distributed among the staff? We know what goes to the shareholders, but how is it being distributed among the staff by level? Uh, I liked the restricted shares. I, I don't like the stock pay in and of itself, but I liked Alex's ideas about restricted pay. And if we were doing a version three, I would probably put some version of that in here. Um, I really was glad that we were onto something about stock options causing all sorts of problems, so that pleased me. And the idea of corporate debt actually comes from the financial services world. Um, there's a colleague I know at EY who um, proposed bail inable debt as a part of the pay for bank executives so that they were on the hook. If the bank failed, they lost their money too. And I think it shouldn't necessarily be bail-inable debt, which is the very most toxic end of the bank um, capital chain, but some kind of debt would force the executives to think about the appropriate level of leverage in their companies, in companies that are increasingly building their gearing to benefit their shareholders and putting debt investors at risk and putting companies into bankruptcy every day on the high street. Um, so I think that might be helpful, though I don't know. We didn't talk about the percentages of that. Talked about increasing those um, paid least because uh, it would have a huge impact on workforce productivity, I believe. 
If we go to recommendation four, these, these next layer multiples I think I've already covered, but I think there aren't too many examples of them yet, but I think they're very powerful and they force a rethink of your salary structures in a company so that you don't just get greed creep all the time. And this is the fair compensation framework. All of you will have heard that in, in boards there are always these, and in companies there are these surveys, these staff surveys. Are people happy? Do they like their job? What's, what's the turnover? What's the whistleblower policy? But how do we know we're treating them decently? How do we measure whether we're treating our staff decently? Um, I think that's incredibly important. And it actually requires the board of directors to engage on how what they say they're doing is reflected in what they're actually doing. And it should make a huge difference in employee satisfaction. So those are the five uh, recommendations. We also put in the paper some next steps. I think that investors who are interested in this subject need to get together to influence the outcome. There are a couple different ideas in the paper about how to do that, but we can talk about that more soon. Um, I do think you have huge power, those of you who are investors in this room, because it is not a one-for-one one, uh, share per vote, because many people don't vote. And many people just vote the recommendations. And so if you start to make noise, you have an outsized influence on the outcomes in the same way that you know, some of the hedge fund investors have outsized influence and some of the owners have outsized influence because if you're there making a point, it picks up speed and it doesn't take, it takes, some of you guys will know better than I do, but it takes a whole lot less than 20% of the votes to have an outsized impact on the, on the outcomes. So, Support the recommendations. I think acting, these, these um, motions that are pushing for removal of remuneration committee members if they don't take the suggested vote on two passing years, I think those are good things to be thinking about. I think we need to think about the web of vested interests, but I think if we do some of these recommendations, that web of vested interests will fall away because there will be less work for all those remuneration consultants and LTIP experts. And then I think we really need to watch for the outcomes on what the UK government has said they're going to do and on the Financial Reporting Council governance consultation. I don't know exactly, maybe some of you in the room know the deadline for that, but I, I know they got a huge number of responses, but I don't know when they actually propose to come out with their answers. So if I can ask Stefan and Edward to come up and then we'll just take questions and comments and recommendations and ideas. <laughs> so, uh, one of the more recent uh, explanations of that has been uh, that as the certainty of paying with these very complex forms has gone down, the actual quanta needs to go up to compensate people for lack of certainty. One of the benefits of the is that you have certainty, you know exactly how much you're going to get paid with, and so that might give more reason for investors. 
risk to pay. Uh, but it seems to me that having the shares in the long term as well, um, shares can go to, go to zero. Yeah, and, I, and I'm not certain, but I, one of the, the interesting idea was putting it in the pension, as if, you know, but no, not many people have defined benefit pensions anymore. But one of the ideas was to align them with the stakeholders on the other side of the balance sheet. Do you see what I mean? On the liability side. What I didn't mention in that is that the debt shouldn't be uh, marketable, right? Because if you could sell it and market it, it's sort of pointless because you have to be able to hold it to maturity to have that at risk. If you can sell it as soon as you know a bad event's going to happen, it's no different than owning equity that you can buy and sell as you please. So I think the idea, the, the intention is to align it with the people who are interested in the long-term stability of the company, which tend to be the debt holders, as opposed to those who are, only, who are interested in the upside. Because the debt holders don't have much upside. Can I just say, I think, um, I think you're right that individually some CEOs may be, sh I asked John Monks this once when he was general secretary of the TUC, what's the use of shame in this world? And he said, well, how do you shame people who are shameless? Um, so I think you've, you, you've probably got a good point in that individuals might not be bothered by a few days bad headlines. But companies themselves, though, and boards will not want the terrible PR hit of being the bad guys, especially if there are competitors in their sector who have a much tighter ratio. I think it's that within sector comparisons that are going to be interesting. I'm glad you're doing this work on sectors. I think that makes it more meaningful and, and, uh, and pointed. So I'm not completely, I mean, I'm, I'm nervous too about how much it will do, but, but I think um, it's not going to be powerless, but yeah, we shouldn't exaggerate it. And the point about share price, yes, I, I, t I take the point that it's a very much a long-term holding. I'm still nervous, though, about too much of a share price later. I think even over a 10-year period, the, the research that I would quote from Lancaster University, uh, Steve Young, the professor of accounting, who looked at 10 years' performance of companies, but under not share prices, he looked at return on invested capital, and he found no connection at all between the growth of CEO pay and that tough measure of return on invested capital. So I, I still want, uh, yes, I think it's good for people to hold shares for the long term. And something like Handels Bank, where you only get your bonus at the end of 30 years of work. You know, this, that sort of long term perspective, I think, is, is much healthier. And if you do that by giving people some shares or encouraging them to buy shares, um, so be it. But I, I would still be nervous about that share element being too large. I, I, I think fixed pay is, is, is underrated. I mean, and if people worry about paying the failure, sack failures. You know, they, they don't pay them. Yeah. Just a second, because the only thing I want to say is there was a study, and we should have quoted it in here, but there's a fund I know that measures all their investments on return on invested capital. And that actually, it's, it's sometimes hard to calculate. Sure, really, sure. But, yeah. but that, that would be a better incentivizing target. If you were going to do anything for executives, it would actually be re long-term return on invested capital, because then they actually have an incentive to invest yeah, yeah. in a way they don't currently have in most cases, because that mostly investment reduces short-term profits and is diluted, sure. and so they don't do it, yeah. and so that's why you get so few. You know, that's why people buy companies instead of investing in capacity, because yeah. that that works better from a return on um, a return point of view, or at least a ROE point of view. I'm sorry, I can't stop talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I work for the investment management firm. Um, we provide engagements uh, as a part of the services and friends of the foundation. And the executive pay is obviously one of our major needs. But I am Japanese and I'm slightly torn uh, to some extent that I do apply to pay because, on one hand, in the US and the UK, we're advocating for more controlled pay. Many of the recommendations you make, obviously, we are aligned with. Um, we want to have better pay outcomes. But in Japan, it's actually the two to be reversed. We're trying to get companies to incentivize and have a far clearer alignment with um, share price even, or you know, return on legacy measures, because in Japan those things haven't existed. 
And what you find in Japan is actually that the corporate executives aren't incentivized by money at all, partly maybe because they're not being paid very much. Actually, what they're incentivized by is power, influence, and empire. So what you find is that the reverse of not having the, the high pay, which often comes with a football manager style, very short tenure, to the average tenure of a CEO in the US and UK is probably only a few years. In Japan, it's the complete reverse. You're never going to get fired. <laughs> but in reverse, you don't get paid very much. So as a result, it all becomes about expression of control and power, even into your eighth or ninth decade. And so within that context, what is the kind of way to strike that balance <laughs> to make sure that, you know, what are we going to give executives in the UK in return for taking away some of their pay? Are we saying to them, actually, you know, we'll, we won't look at your performance in an interim or quarterly cycle? Because I do think that that genuinely drives short terms severely. Uh, but we'll give you a bit more of a five, six year ability to have this kind of project to you know to show how you can contribute not just to the company and the shareholders but all the stakeholder base over time. I mean, what is the, the trade-off that we're going to be giving to the executive classes? Maybe one of them is what Daniel was saying about greater stability in pay. Right? So you don't have so much upside. The certainty. But, but the certainty is you don't have the downside either. I mean you do have the you're gonna get fired if you don't perform uncertainty, but you don't have the, I just can't tell what the share price is going to be and therefore I can't tell what my net worth is going to be in any given year. Uh, I don't, it'd be interesting to poll people and see how much they actually cared about that to do some kind of polling of executives to see if that would make a difference. It would to me because I'm risk averse. <laughs> That's a really interesting point to make and thank you for that. And possibly part of the picture, therefore, is the, the way an enterprise or business is governed, the way the board works um, in relation to the executives. Um, and I really like a few little moments today, this afternoon, have come out and thoughts about how the board should be a bit more proactive and a kind of a bit more enterprising, almost. Often, the big PLC boards are extremely sheep-like. You know, they kind of look around nervously at what everyone else is doing and hire consultants to tell them what everyone else is doing. And and it, the whole thing just kind of gets very claustrophobic, mm. um, which therefore you can see how it kind of plays out in aberrations such as the one we've been talking about. Well, you can see um, how the ratchet occurs that sure, way, right? Sure, sure, yeah. Upper court. How do all the upper courts are? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Sure. All yeah. my children are above average. Yeah. I don't know about yours. Um, so maybe <laughs> something to do with how um, the non-execs, you know, I've got a trend to assume that, that that non-executive bit of the equation is, needs a, a closer look. And perhaps even when it has come out in the report, not that I'm criticising it, so <laughs> that would be a next step. James? Oh, I, I've got two questions, if I may. The first is, about a month ago, I was talking to a grandee of the corporate governance industry who recently retired, and he said the one thing he regretted of his time was spending so much time talking about the executive pay. Yeah. And so I was wondering, with achieving so little, so I was wondering how we thought that we were going to measure progress and, and what good would look like And the, the second is more of a question to you, Barbara. Of you serve on, on company boards, so I was wondering if you'd share the five points with, with some of your colleagues and, mm -hmm. and what feedback you've got. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I actually found myself reading the board's response to the FRC's consultation and writing one from here. So it was, it was an interesting position to see the differences. Um, I have been. I will confess, and I guess anybody can figure out where I'm on the board, it's public, but one of the things I've been making noise about is share buybacks and whether share buybacks really give value and whether we're not just doing that to make sure the executives hit their targets. Um, and that's the one that I think, and that's where Lazonic, who, who I quoted in here, is, is very wound up about it. And I am not enough of an academic to know if he's absolutely right or not. But it is interesting that the government now has a commission to look at share buybacks. Uh, because I think they can be used for appropriate purposes and I think they can be badly misused. So yeah, they do, I mean, they know where I work when they put me on the board, right? 
know, they know where my heart is. So I think they do that. They want to get nearer to God. Yeah, well, actually, don't laugh. There's somebody from the, the EIAG on our board as well. So, I mean, they clearly, you know, they are a long-term company and they care about long-term results, or I wouldn't have joined them. I think you make those choices also for that reason. On the how do we make this, you know, so much time achieving so little, I, I think that's why Friends Provident was so interested in this. You know, what will we do to move the dial in a way that it hasn't been moved yet? And I guess I would in some ways throw the question back to the people in the room. Of all the priorities investors have, why is this not higher up? I'll go to one of the highest. Personally, I'd say that this is like for at least 10 years since the crisis. Probably the most visible one, probably the most like climate change. Um, the most toxic issue that investors are faced with beyond day to day investment. Um, should we agree? Yeah, I agree. But I agree with the thrust of the question and your anonymous grandee, which is that businesses are so much more interesting than the pay packets of two or three people at the top. Businesses do so many more, as you were saying, they do so many more interesting, creative and worthwhile things, not least employing lots of people, which is a really important and good thing to do, which we need to in this looming era of automation. We want people not to have an incentive to get rid of human beings and replace them with machines. We want, to, we want good companies employing people, selling and making good things. And that's really interesting and complicated and varied. And, and yet this big fat chunk of the annual report that's just about two or three people's pay packages with all the Greek and the nonsense in it. That, by the way, my professor of accounting in Lancaster, Steve Young, his PhD candidates couldn't understand them either. PhD accountancy candidates can't understand these remuneration reports. So I, I, I think the, the point's important that we should, there's so much more we should really be talking about. I think it's also interesting if you compare it to the time, is a genuine challenge to the business. Um, I think those that campaign have much more impact capacity if you have the policy, if you have the responses, and so it's a very, very powerful space where people are creating an answer to a really powerful challenge. Whereas this is narrow to all is an inequitable distribution of animals, which those who are going to create that are just far less interested. So I think it's a point about you know, high growth versus high share, and that's what I think what I was talked about a lot. I don't think there's a consensus about the speed with which you need to be addressed. <laughs> And to become systemic. And then what's fascinating, I don't know a lot of the old investors about make a change, maybe it is, but it's fascinating. I personally think very much is the same as not helpful. But it's created a change in the form that spent two more meetings talking about something. Yeah. So even if it's not an active measure, that has suddenly created a tension to use that time in a completely different way than probably any other issue yeah. in the last decade. So maybe the change comes as much internally because it creates a sense of reputation. So the poor chap at the cinema. What's a, I'm well, not feeling the, real sorry for him. It's a poor, isn't it? <laughs> an interesting choice to make because the one thing you couldn't possibly have thought about was his reputation that he hadn't got his company. And neither could his poor because if they would have thought about those things, the answer could not be the mathematical calculation of the answer is satisfied. So they couldn't have framed the question. We don't use reputation at all, we sort of use identity, which is fascinating. But maybe companies defend their reputation more than their identity. Um, so I think it's was a very insight about it's the way all the time is spent. Equally, you see it on some of the diversity statistics, the ones that aren't disclosed because they know it's going to get worse before it gets better. Mm -hmm. That is really fascinating how pressure points have been created, different from some of the work that's. And, and that's what changed my mind, was that it forced a conversation. And it forced, how will the public receive this information? And then, if we have to publish it, which we feel we do, what are we going to say we're going to do to fix it? Because we recognize it's inappropriate as it currently is. And, and it's, it's sad in a way that none of the, 
women's networks or efforts to recruit more women did any of that. Do you see what I mean? It was when they actually had to publish that ratio that it forced it. Do you think it's the same sort of shame about the inequality ratios as there is about the gender pay ratios? Is that going to be the same conversations at board level about how we explain this or address it? I think where it can is not so much to the public as their own staff. You know, is it really that guy adding 200 times more value than I am? <laughs> I'm sitting here until 10 o'clock at night filing, you know, whatever kinds of claims reports or something like that. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I think most people who work in companies would probably are really, really proud of those people in the office. If you end the dialogue, you're trashing the focus on the cure. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know. I wish I knew the answer to that, James. There was a comment over here. I, I think for me, the, the, the moral cooks is best seen in what happens when the company fails or the CEO is told to go. And this would apply to local authorities and health trusts as well. And I, I can see uh, the, the argument that, that uh, someone who grows a company should be rewarded and we can discuss the scale. But uh, in a situation of failure, how does one justify paying a CEO a very large amount of money in terms of a farewell package, pension, and so on, out of all proportion to what the companies fail, but uh, the way we're getting the numbers? Yeah, if you want to try that? Well, I don't think there's any obvious justification for it. I mean, and, and, and when there's, there's talk about risk, but the, the, the CEO carder, if you like, the class, uh, are exposed to very little risk. Perhaps some reputation risk, but they will be more than adequately compensated for that. I mean, there's this element where there is a golden hello, you know, you're bought out of whatever contract you're in, you're compensated for a bonus that you're about to get. Then there are golden handcuffs and things that tie you in with rewards at the end of it, then a golden parachute. But the whole thing is, is a gilded, um, risk-free existence. Once you get into that, which is, I mean, this is called competition theory, right? The idea that you want to be, get to the top, you want to be a CEO, that's actually necessary and even can be very healthy, you know. We don't, we, not everyone's going to get paid the same, but there is a career ladder, there is going to be a hierarchy, we're not all flat. You know, some of this is absolutely normal and natural. It's the degree, as you say, it's the, it's the extent of the gaps and the fear that people are serving themselves rather than the company. You know, that's the other thing that really is worrying, that you know, people are taking out and they think about what they get to take out. I think there's one other, you mentioned the crisis, I think there's one other unspoken thing, and again, this is, in a way, a wild accusation, which I can't Ooh. really back up. But <laughs> Never stopped you before. <laughs> that's true. But, um, you know, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, um, completely startling, would it, if a lot of people at the top of uh, big companies or in finance aren't thinking that maybe, in spite of the apparent recovery of the economy in the wake of quantified, uh, quant uh, quantitative easing and so on, that maybe actually the economy is still extremely fragile and vulnerable? I mean, even, never mind the, the Russian factor that's bubbling up, and that maybe everyone is pretty short term at the end of the day and think, well, I'm going to make sure I'm collecting a very good whack for this job because if it does go wrong, I'll be okay and my family will be okay and I'll be set up. It wouldn't be totally surprising if some people were thinking that privately. I think that the point you're making, which came up in Carillion writ large, is these people walked away with packages and the pensioners, the pension fund was bust and the government ends up bailing out the pension fund. And the fact that the senior executive should be able to walk away with a retirement package while the staff can't is the bit I found most unconscionable in that. And that, I think we need to rethink, also another project, not this one, how the pension guarantee fund works here. You know, the Pension Protections Board, I can't remember the name here, but you know, it's a, it's a really important institution, it's a vital institution, but it doesn't have the teeth it needs to stop 
those funds being drained out or being cut off in an acquisition in an M and A situation or lots of other things. And I think that's the most heinous crime there. Colin, you had a point you wanted to make. Yeah, just come back to this whole issue as a ESG and engagement responsible investment sort of issue. Executive pay in itself has been a priority obviously for quite a long time. It seems to be more about it's in of itself as an issue, maybe reward for pay as opposed to actually joining the up within, within the business. So the current situation seems to be totally disconnected silent of executive pay over here and average pay, average employee pay over here. Um, and in fact, it's the contradictory arguments that keep on down and to push one up in terms of market arguments and things like that. Um, what I think this brings us to and what we're hoping to um, try to instigate over the next, the next year or so is to actually start to join those two things together. And uh, I think the third pay framework that you mentioned sounds like a good way to actually take that forward. So how can we make executive pay and executive pay rises and average employees and their salaries turn them into the same conversation so that companies, the, 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 the profits and the service of the company is actually further redistributed? So I've seen a couple of studies, I don't know, But I have seen studies say that basically your average employee hasn't had a pay rise, a real, um, uh, with the cost of living included, it hasn't had a real pay rise since 2008. Meanwhile, executive pay has trickled over that same period. And that's what we do for actually a cost of executives being rewarded for holding those, that salary down whilst supporting themselves. Um, so the, the question is, how can we get the all of the same narrative and how can investors best use their influence to try to bring about this sort of change within internal funds? Because it should actually be a self-preservation issue. You know, there's been no pay rise. This is against the backdrop of austerity. Now, now what Brexit into the mix, which is only going to make things worse. Um, we don't talk of rising scapegoating of foreigners and Europe and migrants and all the rest of it. It actually could be interpreted as this is a crisis of capitalism, so how can capitalists best save themselves uh, by, by more further and equal redistribution of company service? What would be my best role if you think that investors are planning to do that? I was um, not directly responding to that, but thank you for those points. Um, I was sort of playing the idea in my head, hearing some of the contributions, that although the theme of fairness has obviously been very much put on the tapas, I'm wondering whether the theme of, of, of solidarity between people within an organisation, within a community, is also very valuable. I mean, that, that, the moments of failures are kind of, this is a really well made point, it kind of makes the whole thing very stark. And in a, in a sense, yes, it's unfair, but it's kind of breakdown in that sense of togetherness, really, isn't it? That sense of, of, of solidarity that different people have. We, we, all, we all know that we have different roles within organisations. So I work at the church has very flat pay structures, but I work at a theme where the dean is paid more than me. Um, and I don't kind of feel particularly envious about that, or need or him about it at all. I kind of know that he takes the flack in a certain way and is fulfilling a particular function. And that's appropriate because he kind of faces the world in a slightly different way to the way that I do. Um, but if the, when we get these huge disparities in pay, it's as if that, that solidarity within an organisation is just frayed thin and then torn apart, and the whole thing begins to, to, to crumble away almost. Um, and so, although fairness is, is a very helpful way of seeing it, I think there might be other ways also, moral ways, to remind you that this isn't. Just a technical issue. Because fairness, all too easily, fairness can kind of tip back into a rather technical thing. And we end up with metrics, subject to ratios, and all of that sort of yeah. stuff. And whereas something like solidarity isn't, you know, kind of 
notice a little bit away from it becoming another thing that a group of consultants will have to work away on. You know, it becomes, it reminds us that this is a, a moral issue. The, the argument, the counter argument I would make to that, even though I really like the concept, is that in a, in a country where the average tenure of a chief executive is three years, mm. he hasn't even got to know the names of the people he works with before he's gone. Sure. So what kind of solidarity does he have yeah. well, I think with really, the people? Yeah. That yeah. <laughs> because I, mean, I think it's crazy, really, um, that CEOs are seen as what we've done for a couple of years and this, that, and the other, and before you know it, the golden hellos, goodbyes, and all the other bits of gold have just got crazy. So I mean, that's ridiculous. Daniel, in terms of Colin's point about what do we do, you say, well, you know, if you'd fix this, then we could focus on what really matters. very helpful and, and I'm very conscious of time but I've just had a little bit of a brainstorm is that there's actually a small advantage to the fact that this wasn't available in published form today which allows us to stick on an afterword based on the discussion in this uh, meeting which I think would be very fruitful so if you know without attribution I think we'll try and pull some of the thoughts from this meeting into a last page on the on the publication because I think it's been very helpful Very good idea. The, the one caveat is because the structure of so many industries are so different, there probably isn't a one size fits all framework. Yeah. No. here and then I think I'm going to close it after this.
Some of them will be on our website, but Ed Newell, who started the Institute, who's now at Cumberland Lodge, he wrote a book um, on investment banking and the ethics of investment banking in a Christian context, which, boy, that must have been hard. It is pretty short. <laughs> but, you know, and there are several. There are a lot of people who try and do theology and economics. There's even one called Theoeconomics, I think, but that's really, economics, but that's really more on the economics of the church. Um, but it's it's a growing subject. It's interesting. There's a lot more in the United States and there, than there is in the UK. What's really interesting is how many economists are now writing on the economics of the common good. Jean Tirole, who, wrote, who won a Nobel Prize, has written a book on this. Um, the former chief economist of the World Bank has written a book on this. So economists are also starting to realize that market economics isn't doing the trick for society. So it's actually, interestingly, converging from both directions. And I think you'll see a lot more on it, um, at least you know, in each pocket. I don't know how much they'll talk to each other, but uh, I hope no, they do. I'm, I'm sure it's true that economics is much more like theology than it is a science. You know, much more like, yeah. like theology. He's, he's done both. I've only done economics, but I'm inclined to agree with him. Um, I would just like to really thank everybody who came today and everyone who helped us work through the thoughts of these pap this paper. If you have other thoughts on how to build uh, some momentum behind it or specific comments, I'll even take typos in the paper if you find them because it hasn't gone to print yet. Um, I would be extremely grateful and I would also very much like to thank all our speakers. I would particularly like to thank Colin and our Friends and Friends Provident Foundation. Uh, so thank you very much. And there's tea behind if anybody needs it.